inside of the building is a concrete frame. There's a stair core uh, at the back of the building on the right hand side, uh, and that gives the building its stability. So it stops the, the floors from swaying over each other in the wind. Uh, but other than that, all of the concrete slabs within the building are supported on their edges by these stones. So you can, you can see there's a kind of standoff between the stone and the slab. We wanted to make it very clear that the stone is what's holding the building up and that there are no columns hiding in the, in the finishes. So there's a, there's a connection. Everybody asks, is it thermally broken? We have a, a, a balcony style connection in there with a uh, nylon um, spacer that separates the, separates the steel from the concrete slab on the inside. Um, and so all the load comes down the columns. The columns are sized to carry the load that they're taking. So they get smaller as they go up the building. The columns on the corner are smaller than the columns at the, uh, in the middle of the span where they pick up more load. So it really speaks of, um, speaks of the physics and the statics that, um, uh, that are going on. And then the finishes in the stone, I, I mean, um, went to uh, Lyon. I think he was looking at, at Lyon where they have huge stone components in a lot of the buildings and quite rough stone components that have been covered up and are now being, it's fashionable to expose them. Um, and I think that the process of making these stones, particularly drilling, splitting the beds and then cutting them, um, gives the building a language that, um, uh, that it wouldn't otherwise have had. So these three finishes, it's just how it's done in the quarry. There's nothing else, no kind of dressing. And I think, um, uh, I mean, personally, I, you look at uh, vernacular architecture, it develops its own language because of the constraints and the place that it's in. So, so you know, you build with mud or with reeds or whatever, you know, pitched roof because you haven't got rubber membranes. The, the style of the buildings comes from the pragmatics. And, and becomes incorporated into, into architecture, in effect. We're talking about um, Egyptian temples being originally made with mud bricks and having to have big cornices. And the big cornices are reproduced on the stone buildings even though they don't need them. And I guess the Greek walls are slightly like this because they're made with mud. So that thing about the pragmatics informing the architecture and giving the building a style, I find really interesting. And I think that's what, that's what I mean is done with with this building that the pragmatics of quarrying have given the building a particular style and a particular look. Um, whereas I think in, in a kind of global market for construction products um, uh, and also the kind of symbiosis between demand and supply that there's a disconnect between the place because you're buying globally and there's also a disconnect between the time because we're still making bricks. Uh, the coal era, the brick era, you know, being of kind of 300 years ago, we make bricks uh, because there's demand for bricks. We demand bricks for buildings because they make bricks and we end up stuck in this endless cycle of, of So we're not really anchored in time and we're not really anchored in place, which I think is interesting. Whereas if you kind of boil it down to what can be made, how can it be made? If you make it like that, what does it look like? Then that's really informative of, a, of, a, of an architectural style. And the building speaks of the, the engineering and the, and the surroundings as well as, uh, well as the architecture. So the three finishes are they, they, they drill holes in the stone to remove it from the yeah. quarry and then they saw it and then... Yeah, they have. So if the bed of the stone is uh, four or five hundred millimetres deep, they drill a line of holes, they plug and feather. So they put wedges down the holes and they drive a plug in. That splits the stone, which rips itself off of the bed. And then those big chunks are cut up into, into these columns. So here you can see the three finishes. The, uh, the drilled holes in these finishes here. The ripped bed is this kind of fossily, much gnarlier piece of stone here, and then the cut faces um, down the sides. So, uh, you know, it's really, I mean, I think not only is it a great style, it's a tremendous cost saving. Where, where does this stone actually come from? Uh, it comes from France, Chamarac. Uh, so it's kind of middle of France. The, the people are, well, France in quarrying terms is far more industrialized than the UK, so there's a lot of. Um, much bigger production in stone than we can get locally here. I don't know why the quarrying industry here isn't um, isn't bigger or more sophisticated. I guess it's a tradition or kind of question of tradition. But uh, France is local to London. Uh, the middle of France is the same distance as Scotland. So, um, so I think uh, although we'd rather be digging up digging it up under our feet, actually being and bringing it from the middle of France is uh, isn't such a bad thing. But also it's the it's the prospect. So we. We can prove that we can build in this way and satisfy people that it's achievable and that then a kind of local industry would grow out of that. So there's kind of steps of like 
you know, bringing it into um, into the kind of canon and building uh, building types, uh, and then kind of hoping that a more local industry grows up. We started working with stone, designing stone cantilever staircases for um, for the stone masonry company in Pierre Pidot, and it's really grown more and more into much bigger buildings and much bigger projects. Um, stone is inexhaustible, and zillions of cubic meters of stone are made by volcanicity every year. Um, there's absolutely no way we could ever use the stone that's available to us. The stone is incredibly strong. It's much stronger than concrete. It requires very little processing. On our assessment, a stone reinforced stone beam has about a tenth of the carbon footprint of a reinforced concrete beam. And it seems if you're, in a, if you're an alien landing on Earth and you saw the global warming problem and you saw people living amongst these great big heaps of rocks, you would wonder what the... <laughs> what the problem was. Uh, so we, we, I mean, I think personally, stone is an amazing opportunity. Uh, requires so little um, plant and investment to make, a, to make a factory producing stone beams compared to steel beams. Uh, and actually it could be a great decarbonizing opportunity. You know, a, a safer um, and a less malignant decarbonizing opportunity than nuclear power or some of the other solutions that we're, we're going to. So I think stone is, and not only that, but it's a, it's a natural material and I think for buildings like this it's, it's ennobling that their structure is on show and that they're using natural materials rather than, uh, rather than steel fests covered in, uh, covered in cheesy padding. Which is, uh, so to be sustainable though, do you have to dig it up close to where you build it? It's better, I mean, to put it into context, the steel comes from Brazil. I don't know where the cement comes from, but uh, yeah, great, dig it up really close to where you are. I think the um, I mean, what I found really interesting is looking at a map of map of Edinburgh, uh, the new town, the centre of Edinburgh is quite a big zone, and it's all made with this particular Craigleith sandstone. I was thinking, where is the Craigleith quarry today? It's under the Sainsbury's car park. I mean, it's this little speck on the map of Edinburgh. And when you zoom out and you look around Edinburgh, you see all of these dark green rectangles where the timber's growing. You know, forestry is, uh, you know, it's not the biggest industry in the UK, but there's quite a lot of it. and um, I was thinking actually in a tree you produce one and a half cubic meters of seven newton relatively weak material over the course of 25 years and you occupy the land with a monocultural forest for 25 years actually under the tree 500 cubic meters of 100 newton granite and you could have it out in a month so you think in terms of tying up the land with unenvironmental uses actually stone is quite a good solution and the um, quarrying local quarrying particularly it's very punctual and it's very productive. You know, you get a lot of material out of a quarry quite quickly, uh, whereas you know you have to grow trees everywhere, which is uh, not necessarily the best thing for the countryside. But I think there's a huge potential for stone to be really low cost. If you get a chunk of limestone, you crush it, you burn it, you turn it into cement. If you get a chunk of limestone and you stick it straight in the building, it seems to me really obvious that, that that's a more expedient way to build than um, all the other processes that people go through. So tell me a little bit about the practice and what sort of work you're doing now. We're now about 70 people. We're roughly one third, um, one third MEP building services and two thirds structures. Uh, so we're very small multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary practice. Uh, we're doing all kinds of work. We work at the airports. We just did a huge underground baggage handling terminal for a 190 million in Heathrow Airport. And on the other hand, we're doing a tiny 45,000 pound extension to Pitts Hanger, uh, Pitts Hanger Gallery Lodge, which is a plywood, uh, kind of cut plywood structure. So we work at all scales and we work on all kinds of jobs. We're, we're just beginning um, uh, a project called Old Paradise Street with Field and Clegg, which is a, um, a developer Bywater, which is a big um, timber frame, a really large timber framed office building that we're really excited about. Um, and kind of bringing, bringing new materials into projects at scale is something we quite like. So we're, we're working with Amin Taha at the moment on a project in Finchley Road, which is a 10-story load-bearing stone frame. So very similar to, to the one that we're standing outside here at, uh, at Clerkenwell. But in this case, uh, it's a much taller building. It's, it's made of three, uh, three components. Um, and in this case, the stone frame is actually the stability structure as well as the vertical structure. Uh, and um, what we really like about these projects is bringing the structure 
making it part of the architecture and giving the building some depth. So, in, I mean, in the case of this one, the stone is holding up the building. The building's loading the stone, and the, the structure and the architecture are intrinsically linked, and the building has some some depth because you can see these things from the outside as well as the inside. And we really like to design buildings like that. But uh, tell me about some of the engineers who have inspired you and you've worked with. So I was trying to work out where we where we got our culture from as a practice, and I think uh, a lot of it comes from Anthony Hunt, or people that worked for Anthony Hunt. So I don't didn't work for Anthony Hunt directly, but I worked for a guy called Mark Whitby, who uh, I think is on another one of your shows, uh, and also Steve Morley, who was an amazing engineer designing stadiums, worked at Wembley Stadium, Stadium Australia. But they really kind of carried the culture from Anthony Hunt down to practices like Whitby Bird and uh, Modus and people like that went on to, uh, on to us. So at Whitby Bird, we'd find uh, A3 sketch paper. And Mark would always be kind of inveterate scribbler. Uh, so everyone in our office goes to sketching boot camp. Everyone learns to draw in perspective. We want everyone to learn to, to conceptualize in three dimensions and to really to engage their, you know, as engineers, to engage their creativity and actually to have an agenda of some kind beyond just uh, making the numbers stack up. But I, looking back further beyond Anthony Hunt, actually, uh, I think he worked for Frank Newby. Frank Newby was working for Felix Samueli. Felix Samueli came to the UK in the 30s uh, as, a, as an aeronautical engineer. And I've seen in the talk about him, I've seen sketches of a shed that he was building in Hatfield, and you can see this. Um, I mean, A, he's sketching by hand, and B, you can see these tendons and these pins holding the roof of this industrial shed together. I'm suddenly thinking, this guy has taken this from an aeroplane wing to put it into a shed. Is this the kind of crossover moment from old aeronautical engineering to high tech? And that actually he then did with Powell and Moyer, the Skylon, Frank Newby did the bird aviary, and then Anthony Hunt is this explosion of high tech with Grimshaw and people and um, I find that really interesting. So having worked in Europe there's a huge tradition of mathematics and um, uh, uh, in, in engineering and engineering is a very um, high, uh, as you say, a very haughty subject, you know, it's, it's more esteemed and, uh, and I think um, that perhaps Arabs is like that, half older like that, they're very analytical whereas I think I always associate Anthony Hunt with more straightforward stunts and tricks. He's a sort of BMX rider of the engineering world rather than a kind of long distance cyclist and I really enjoy that and I think that's the kind of thing that characterizes our practice that we, we like to do cheeky little details and uh, really enjoy the putting together and, and I think that culture of uh, kind of engineering creativity has come from that from that lineage. Mm -hmm.